Item B4, report out of closed session. Uh, those before took no action in, in the closed session. Uh, item B5, adoption and change in the order of the agenda. Uh, we do have a change. The Attendance Matters Initiative encourages superior school attendance. Each trimester in San Bruno, schools challenge each other to have the highest attendance rate in the district. Tonight, we are honoring schools for their accomplishments. The honor for most improved attendance goes to Portola Elementary. The efforts made to increase attendance also resulted in Portola having the highest attendance. So both banners are being presented to the pandas. And here to accept is Portola's incredible principal, Dr. Sheila Crox. Um, since this is the first time that we have really given a report like this, I'm starting out very basic and very, um, very basic. So we're going to talk about the 2018-19 maintenance operations and transportation. And as you can see in this first um, uh, clip is a picture of all of our um, people in our maintenance operations and transportation, which are our maintenance workers, our custodians, and um, our bus drivers. We had gotten together for this celebration in this particular picture um, just after to celebrate all the work that was done uh, at the through the summer. And we um, presented this group with a nice little chip. So going to the next slide, we have um, our maintenance crew. And as you can see, we're starting out with um, John Daly as our supervisor. We have Marco Costaza, a maintenance two worker, who's been with us for 17 years. Gary Pettineri, also a maintenance two worker. He's been with us for 20 years. And then uh, newly hired, Freeland, and I spelled it wrong, um, Hollins, maintenance two, and he's been with us for one month. Um, Jadir, I cannot pronounce the last name, I'm gonna try. He is our gardener too. It's and he's it's actually Peter. Peter. And oh I'm sorry, I hear Devere all the time, so that's why I pronounced it that way. Um, he's been with us for 17 years, and we have Carlos Sanchez, who is also a gardener too, and he's been with us for two years. Going on to our operations, which are our custodians, we have um, Robert Sherlock, Bob. And he is at Allen. He's been with the district for 19 years. Jose Gabriel, um, also at Allen. He's been with us for two years. Irma Hudson, who does three areas, 
um, Hesselgren, the district office in Roman Wood, and she's been with us for three months. Jim Fanning, he's up at John Muir, four years. Michael Friesner has been, is at John Muir, and he's been with us for 33 years. Um, Isidro has been at, um, uh, Alfredo Isidro have been at Parkside, and we have at five years for Alfredo and three years for Isidro. Maria has been at Parkside um, in the district for eight years, and Stephen Stedford is also at Parkside, and he's been here for 16 years. Lourdes is up at Portola. She's been here seven months, not seven years. And Rocky um, at Portola, he's been with us for over 10 years. Fernando is at Rollingwood, and we, at, I think, at um, our November meeting, I told you we were really staffed, but unfortunately, we are now um, looking for a road and set. Then we move on to our transportation, our uh, bus drivers. We have Amanda Nelson, and she drives one of our white van bus, uh, buses, and she's been here about a year. Um, Joy um, is also a white van bus driver. She's been with us for six years. Chris Berlinger um, is also a white van bus driver, also six years. Lynn, her husband, has been with us for over 12 years, and he is also does a white van. And we have Henry, who does the big mini bus, as we call it, and he's been with us for three years, and to Daryl, who also um, is in the um, food service, but he also drives our bus for uh, students, and he's been with us eight years. Amanda and Joy and Chris all have other jobs as well, whether they be a um, instructional aide or working in the office at Parkside. So the manual tasks, uh, annual tasks that uh, maintenance has to do, um, we have to work with the fire marshals, so we have the fire marshal inspections, we have the elevator and lift inspections, there are two different things at Parkside, we have both of them. Most of the other sites are just the, um, the lift. Um, we have back row inspections. Um, those, include, those are for the sprinklers and the water heater fire systems. We have the water drainage slash hazardous inspections. And the hazmat certification is done on an annual basis. We have the playground safety inspections that is done. Um, we have a person in uh, our ranks that goes and takes the uh, certification class so that they can be the one to perform those um, inspections. And this year it's done by the supervisor. And we have groundwater testing. And uh, this was done at Bel Air, John Muir, Portola, and Rowan Wood. And to report, we have passed all of those annual uh, inspections for this year. The other tasks that maintenance does, they have quarterly inspections of all the HVAC units, um, that being the heating and air conditioning units. Um, they change the filters, they change the belts, they look and repair wherever is necessary. And there's some slides, some pictures in the back that show you where we had some um, replacements and some of them where we have some work that we have to do on them. Um, the biannual test of all of the sprinklers and at that time, we test all the sprinklers, make sure that all the heads are working, and um, look for all any leaks that there might be in the lines, and we repair and replace as necessary. And we daily inspect sites for any needed repairs. And since we're in this wonderful weather at this particular point in time, we have been watching and looking at all of our gutters, and in some instances, we've had to replace them because they rust through. Our, still on our ongoing tasks, um, just to give you kind of a preview of what um, happens, we have a work order system, and we have the sites that we request them to put in work orders, and then um, the supervisor will look at them on a daily basis and assign the tasks to the different maintenance workers and or gardeners or whomever needs to um, do the tasks. And, and the work order system since July, we had 2,230 work orders in. Uh, that doesn't really count all the times when somebody stops one of our maintenance people and says, 
hey, I need this, or hey, this isn't working, or hey, I would you please? And you know, we're very accommodating. We try. We want to be able to keep a record of what we're doing, so we we encourage <coughs> the sites to use the work order system. We've um, completed 2,169. We've had uh, since July one. We've had 34 um, new requests, and in, we've got about 27 requests that are in the approval, approval process, meaning we need to look at what it is that they want, need to be repaired, how are we going to repair it, what are the costs involved, are we going to be able to do it in-house, or do we have to contract out? And the times of, um, the, the work orders are reviewed on a daily, <coughs> as I mentioned before, basis, and they're prioritized and assigned to the staff. Um, the the type of tasks can range from clogged drains, leaks in the roofs or classrooms, the H HVAC issues, vandalism, which we tend to have a, a bit of, furniture moving, and key issues. The work order system is our bright line of defense in keeping up with the safety issues and regular maintenance matters. The gardening crew inspects sites on a daily basis to remove any palm trees as necessary, and of course with the wind blowing and everything, we're we're fully prepared to be looking at all the sites tomorrow, especially since the wind has been so strong, um, especially today. We've removed many trees that have um, fallen and or have been uh, looking like they need to be replaced, because whether it was from disease or whatnot. So some of the major re um, repairs that have gone on uh, back at remember back in March um, of this year, uh, Hesselgren had uh, some restroom issues requiring the hazardous material removal and renovation, and that was all completed in six days, and that was able to be um, mostly paid for through our insurance. Um, in April, um, at Allen, we had an HVAC, uh, HVAC um, in our NDF room, which is our computer where they store our computer equipment, such as our servers and those kind of things. And um, it was going out, and the computer equipment has to be kept in a, a cool degrees, so we had to get that replaced, so that was replaced. In May, we discovered a, a leak in the boys' restroom at Parkside, and um, again, that took us a few days, but we got that repaired also. Um, also in May, unfortunately, we do have outside factors that uh, influence our um, sites, and in this particular instance, it was a car accident, and they tore through the fencing and they destroyed the water fountain at Parkside. It took a long time to get the insurance on board to uh, make sure that all the, the paperwork is in place and everything, but it now has been fully replaced. Also in June, um, we put in new parking lights um, up at John Muir in the parking lot. Um, December of this year, we discovered um, in the classroom at Portola, there was um, water leaking into it, and we discovered that it was because of rusted gutters, and we have replaced those at this time. So the next couple slides are just pictures of things that have, uh, where we had to do that. These are the, what the gutters that were total looked like that had to be replaced. This one is the new HVAC unit replaced over winter break at John Muir. And you can see it looks very nice. But here's another one that we have issues with. Um, on this side, you can see, if you're looking at it, be on the left hand side, um, that should be a lever that we should be able to use to help us. And as you can see, it's resting away. So that has to be replaced, and that's on our um, in our um, projects to, to get replaced. That was just one of them, um, and this is a John Muir, and there was three on uh, on the roof, and so there's the other two that are having the same type of similar issues. It just really goes to prove our infrastructure is really aging. We've got old equipment and it's time for a lot of this stuff to be replaced and repaired and with the um, bond projects that we're going to be having come forward, these will be some of the things that will happen. 
In the operations, there you go, our custodians, we are, training is ongoing. Um, we get a lot of help from our vendors. They do a lot of training for us. Um, and we also do a lot of in-house training. There are uh, particular uh, people who have expertise and they share it with all the other um, uh, people that are our custodians. And um, SMICSIG, which is a San Mateo County Schools Insurance Group, they are always coming out to help us, give us two pointers. They have um, a lot of classes and training that they are willing to um, have our uh, employees go to, and those are usually at no cost, and so we always take advantage of those. And during the breaks, um, the custodians, they have deep cleaning, and um, the breaks, uh, I've gotten to hear the summer break, the spring break, and winter break. And we have to keep in mind that those um, custodians are 12 month employees, and they have to have their vacations also. Um, we like to do some of these deep cleaning and these other little projects during the time that the uh, children are not in school to make sure everybody is safe. So we always have a little bit of issues to make sure a little bit of um, somebody wants to go on vacation, we still need to get these done. So we do a lot of juggling. The custodians work in collaborations with the teachers and the students and the and administrators. The teachers and administrators are always asking the custodians to do little special things for them and they're all willing to, to help. In our transportation area, um, in the vehicles, we have one mini yellow bus and it holds about 19 students and the driver. Um, there's a, there was a new requirement that we had to put in place and um, we did this over one of the breaks and um, it's a warning system called No Kid Left Behind and it's when the, the bus comes into the yard and um, the driver turns off the vehicle, he's got 45 seconds to go through the bus and get to the back where there is a button that he has to push to say there are no students on board. Otherwise, an alarm will go off. And we have four white vans, and each of them hold about eight students and the driver. Currently, we bus about 32 students. The majority of our students are within the city limits of San Bruno, and we have two, stu two students um, bus to Redwood City. These are all done in-house with our own vehicles. We still do have students that are transported to uh, non-public schools, and a lot of times those are done with our contracted service, uh, via the service. Um, we do contract with the county office to assist us in routing of the buses. Before we did that, it was a hit and miss, and uh, do we have this right today, and maybe we don't, but now that we're working with the county to help us really um, coordinate our uh, routing, it's been working very fine. So, um, again, like I said, we still have students that are transported outside the city limits, and we do have to use contracted um, services for that. So as we move forward, and this will be probably the next quarterly um, re report that we would be talking about, are the uh, Measure X projects. Even though they're going to be done by um, outside contractors and whatnot, our in-house will be working very closely with the um, contracted services because we're going to be rebuilding Allen. We're going to modernize Joan Muir, modernize Parkside, modernize Portola, and modernize Bel Air. And based on what the bond measure had uh, in the language, those are the items that we are going to be doing. We will be also creating a facilities <coughs> master plan so that we can put on a basis like a five-year deferred maintenance um, plan on what things are going to be coming up that need to be replaced, that need to have repair, that any of those kind of things that we've got to get done. You know, think about it, we also, there's painting that is something that will need to be done, there's a uh, carpet that probably needs to be replaced in places. All of those things are what we're going to incorporate into that master's facilities plan so that we have a record of them and we know and then we can do a timeline to figure out when these things are going to get accomplished. And we also, along with that, that's where we're going to be prioritizing our deferred maintenance projects. And 
That's a simple, basic, very overview of our maintenance operations and transportation. Are there any questions? The chair, uh, can you hear me? Right. Let's, start, let's start with that. Um, first off, what is the work order system you're using, like a CMMS system? <laughs> it's old school, dude. And All right. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, it's a, a web-based type of system that uh, the sites have uh, availability to get into and put in the requests. Well, my next question, what's your average completion turnaround for a work order for the district? Can you, can you give me a ballpark there? Within a couple of days, unless it's a major project. It, in the system, does it kick out a work order every six months for, say, HVAC repairs or? No, those, the, the, the work orders are placed on a daily basis. And on a daily basis, the supervisor goes in and looks at those work orders and prioritizes them. Anything that is a safety um, factor that needs to be done because of safety reasons, it will be put on the very top of the list and it will be assigned to the maintenance crew and they will go out and get it done. If um, within that system they need parts, uh, correct for a given work work order repair. What's the threshold for procurement? Um, when do we actually, the district, look at procurement? Is what sort of threshold? Uh, are you talking that where we would have to go out to bid for something? Yes, imagine like a large capital project. What, what's that uh, threshold? Um, I believe I can. If you're going to crucify me because I'm not going to be able to give you the exact number. Um, the the uh, Office of Public School Construction puts out a dollar amount every year as a threshold, I believe it's... John, do you know how much it is? Last I heard it was 15000 For the small projects, it's 15000 but for the higher projects, I believe it's up around 70000 And that changes. The, the 15000 um, for the small projects doesn't change, but the other one, for the larger uh, projects that we may have, that it's, it changes every single year. The um, CDE sends that uh, information out, and it's on the CDE website. Thank you. Um, my next question is, is the maintenance staff, particularly the staff that deals with trees um, and harbor-related issues, are they trained on the city of San Bruno's heritage tree policy? I don't. Oh, OK. Yes, they are. Fantastic. And you mentioned the removal of several trees across our campuses. Um, do we have any ideas of what types of trees? Are they coastal live oaks? Are they, are they willows? Or? I'm going to really refer to John on that because I don't know that answer. You can tell I've been preparing for these questions. <laughs> <laughs> Currently, throughout the seven sites, and then we've removed 17 trees, most of them sycamores. One second, John. I'm sorry. One second. Um, do, you, do you know how many questions you have for John? I've got two more. Oh. Go ahead. Um, we've removed 17 trees throughout the seven sites, and then they've all been dead. Um, we had three that were in that we had to have an arborist to actually take a look at. Most of them were sycamores, um, and there's some germers. But there's no oaks or anything else that we've had to have. All right, thank you. And there are times when PGE comes in and says that they have to remove them also because they're interfering with the, the lines, and PGE will cut them down. But then the district is responsible responsible for removing the um, <coughs> Thanks. My last question was around water. So I was kind of expecting a pie chart on water. Our average to twenty to thirty thousand we spend per month at the city of San Bruno. Do we have a breakdown as far as where that water is going, as far as categories? I can give that. But okay. No, I don't have that. I'm talking like you know water, uh, grass, um, you know, drinkable, potable water, I and mean, there's several categories of water that the district uses. I'm just curious. Utilities. Water. That will take me some time I because I don't want to go through the, the different um, bills. Um, probably give me a good month to be able to do that. Okay, thank you. No, no further questions. The chair, I have one question. When you look at the breakdown of work orders, 
terms of breaking down the work orders, what school has the, the key track that has the most and what, what school has the least? Parkside, Parkside has the most. <laughs> What's the least repairs? So Bel Air has the least. Good evening, Board of Trustees, uh, President Martinez. Um, I did want to say that on behalf of SBA and me personally, I think the maintenance staff does a phenomenal job. Unfortunately, and somewhat ironically, that gutter and the flooded classroom were mine. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's doing great. There's no more big puddle, and it's drying out, so it, it's great. But. On a, on a real note, um, as evidenced by the warrants later on, you'll see that, unfortunately, Mr. Daly is still not a district employee, but in the presentation to the board, it's, he's not listed as a consultant, which I think would be a little more transparent, um, as well as um, Mrs. Wellman, the CSCA president, and myself are still concerned about the level of supervision and evaluation as he is still a consultant or an outside contractor, however you want to word that. Um, I have made attempts to try to review the, I know we do outside contracting with Brady Air and other, other entities, um, so they would all have proper insurance and, and whatnot. So I have made attempts to um, reach out and I'm hoping that I can work with the administration to kind of review those contracts just to kind of alleviate Ms. Wellman. And it hasn't happened yet, but I'm hopeful that that can happen. trustees of San Bruno community. I want to wish a happy new year to everyone uh, and, and welcome back to our uh, first uh, board meeting for 2019. Oh. <laughs> 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 Okay, so I'm going to use my teacher voice <laughs> and stand up. Okay, so since the last board meeting, uh, well, oh, hang on, New Year's Eve was just two weeks away, two weeks ago. Can you imagine that? But in reality, a uh, lot of things have happened for us uh, since, since we come back to the school year. Um, First of all, before winter break, I attended a number of holiday events at our schools, and I want to thank everyone for helping our students and families make these wonderful new memories. Uh, they were some fantastic performances, and I know a lot of work and effort went in to make those happen. Um, thank you to all of those who you, you made donations to our families. In the season of giving, the district families and students in need received tremendous support for the holidays from the police and fire departments, Recology, the Lions Club, and members of the business community. We also had a generous anonymous donation for to cover lunches at Bel Air, to cover the lunch bills for students at Bel Air who were unable to uh, pay their bills. The month of January is the launch of our planning for 2019 and 2020. As I'm out visiting classrooms, I've been looking for evidence of the implementation of our designated ELD and instructional strategies aligned to the rigor of Common Core, and as well as evidence of strategies that the schools are using to improve to improve, to improve student outcomes. This week, we are holding our mid-year chat with the principals, and the purpose of the mid-year check-in is to hear about the progress each school is making towards their 2018-19 goals, to get feedback on our support from the district office, and to gather information to assist us with planning for next year. 
As we move into planning for 2019-2020, last week I met with Valerie and Wahi to begin the planning for the professional development for our pre-K and our TK program. And before the end of the month, the Big Lift Community Collaborative will launch to develop our plan for addressing three areas for early learning, access, communication and programming options across the community, and, and professional development. Last week, I also met with our wonderful site mentors, our teacher mentors, uh, who support our new and first-year teachers in the transition to the school district. We talked about their work with new teachers, learned about coaching practices, and I gathered input from them to work on planning for next year. I met with Karen Byrne this week as we do each month, uh, last week as we, did, uh, as we do each month, and among the topics that we discussed was about teacher retention strategies. The TK and K enrollment window for 2019-2020 and the interdistrict transfer process has started, and Sarah, Sarah will share more about this. Um, and this information will inform our staffing for next year. Uh, Wendy and I met with the Business Advisory uh, Committee, subcommittee, last Thursday, and a report will be made out uh, from the committee reports. Last week, as part of the San Mateo County Superintendents Association, I had the opportunity to meet with Michael Kirst on his first day of retirement as the president of the State Board of Education. And he talked about the changes that he has led over the last year uh, on the state board, the impact of the efforts, and the work of influential groups on our educational system. And he made suggestions on how school districts and school boards could better engage themselves into this, this work. The second week back has been extremely busy. Wendy and I were in San Francisco on Monday afternoon to meet with Moody's. Uh, they are a rating agency that will set our district's credit rating for the upcoming bond sales. Uh, we should hear from Moody's decision regarding our credit rating sometime next week. Additionally, Wendy and I uh, went to the governor's uh, budget workshop meeting yesterday. Our new governor, Governor Newsom, be careful because I won't call him Governor Brown, has made some interesting proposals in his budget. Uh, these programs that he's outlined might have impact on us as related to early childhood education and state facilities on it. And some funds are proposed for special education, but they're related to early intervention services. And I don't even know whether our district will qualify for those. Uh, he has also proposed some relief to districts on the contribution for certificated and classified retirements. And uh, we'll keep an eye on this over the next few months. In the next few weeks, we'll be launching the planning and input for a comprehensive educational plan, beginning with a portrait of the graduate profile development, and the efforts of this community group will establish the vision for our educational programming. With the generous underwriting of Google and our committee of local stakeholders and representatives from industry will come together over the next five months, getting at the end of January, to develop this vision for our graduates. When completed, this portrait of the graduate will become a vision that drives our educational plans for the district and influence the development of goals and actions for teaching and learning, goals and actions for education technology, and goals and actions for classroom environment. I'd like to remind everyone that our annual district survey and LCAP development survey window is open. Uh, it will be open through January the 20th. They're available online, and paper versions will be available uh, at the school's offices. And educational services will provide information regarding input sessions at some of our schools. The computer science after school coding winter session classes have begun. We have over 120 students registered for winter and spring sessions that are offered at Parkside, Allen, Bel Air, and John Muir. And I want to thank the Education Foundation for helping to support this expanded learning opportunity. Uh, right before the holidays, we were notified that the Peninsula Healthcare District, uh, by the Peninsula Healthcare District, that the district was awarded a $75,000 grant to support a uh, program and services for the Bel Air Community Health Center for the 2019-2020 school year. And finally, in closing, I'm going to say that January is National School Board Appreciation Month, and I'd like to close by sharing a little bit about the school boards in California. I don't know whether anybody knows about this, but it, uh, our first public school was founded in San Francisco in 1850, and right after that, the city of San Francisco founded their support of education. From that first schoolhouse in San Francisco, boards of education have grown to oversee county offices and school, and school districts of every type here in California. One school district in our state has only six students, and LA has more than 600,000, but they all come together to serve 6.2 million students. There are 5,100 school board trustees in the state of California that aid in the establishment of education standards and benchmarks, and they provide a critical link between accountability of the school system and local constituents and offer accessibility to voters that is unrivaled by any other public uh, office holders. They are the largest group of, official, of elected uh, officials in the state of California. 
Um, the California School Board Association was um, established in 1953 after several renditions, and their work is to support and dedicate the strengthening and promoting the school board governance and driving education, public education policy and agenda for advocacy, training, and member services. Many of our school board members are volunteers. Many of them are full-time employed, 41%. And in addition to that, they come in late hours to serve the community because it's a labor of love for the children to ensure that their community thrives. So in appreciation for your support of, uh, of our community, as a school board member, we want to give you a little pin because you truly are a difference maker for the San Bruno community. That's my report. to hear when these dates 
may be offered to our parents so that we can have an open and honest com uh, conversation about the issue and not just for surveys. I think surveys is a great tool to use, but I feel when you get parents in the room, I feel that there's more interaction and it's more, um, right? I think we just are getting away from the human contact. So um, surveys, I think, are a great tool, but I feel that a meeting uh, would be a better, would be another option for parents to come voice their opinions. And also will give us as board members the opportunity to hear what the concerns are. So I'd like to see some dates. Maybe you and Don can work on some dates to provide um, uh, some time for meetings to for these meetings to happen to uh, provide this opportunity for our parents. respond to uh, my request about the meeting regarding this issue at person. Yeah. My response was that I would meet with the principal and look at his action plan and see what he has in place. I know that he's been working on this and that when we have some dates, we'll come back and inform the board about that. Two curricula for piloting. 
Uh, these teachers also attended, attended a training this evening in order to begin their pilot of the two series. They will begin piloting the first of those uh, two curricula um, in February, followed by another pilot in March. The materials will be made available for public preview before a recommendation is made for an adoption. Also, a committee of 10 teachers representing all grade levels um, has begun the exploration phase of the newly adopted or state adopted materials for science. These teachers had an opportunity to attend the science curriculum fair that was held at the county office on Monday and Tuesday. The teachers will be providing feedback as a committee and then we will plan to pilot um, our science uh, curricula in um, winter of 1920. Our LCAP survey window has opened um, it will remain open until Sunday, uh, January 20th. Our goal is that we have at least half of our families complete the survey. Last year we had about 30%. Um, we are almost there, but we still need more responses. Um, we have some upcoming meetings uh, scheduled at Bel Air and Parkside and Allen. And um, we're also working with some um, parents for John Muir to schedule some focus group sessions. The, those results will be discussed at our SAC meeting at the end of this month. Last night, we held our third DLAC meeting for the school year at the district and discussed the process of identification, or process for identification as an English learner, the programs and services, services offered by San Bernardino Park School District, the process for reclassification, and the implications for students who are not reclassified by the time they enter high school. I was really encouraged to see some new faces um, at DLAC, and I'm pleased to report that we do have DLAC parent representation from every school site. I'd like to encourage no more parents and guardians to attend DLAC um, and their school's ELAC. Um, our next DLAC meeting is coming up on March 12th, so I look forward to seeing everyone there. <laughs> Thank you, that's my report. board meeting, I've been very busy tackling a number of timeline-driven and labor-intensive tasks. For student services, our enrollment forms, all of the registration forms, TK, K, and on, um, as well as our inter- and intra-district transfer forms had to be completely redone to be compliant with new legislation that went into effect on January 1st, as well as um, some legislation we discovered was already in effect um, that required some changes to the way that our forms were um, compiled. So we redid everything and took the opportunity to try to make them more streamlined for parents and office managers. We made them all fillable forms um, and we aligned the formatting more closely with our student information system to help reduce data entry errors. We're gearing up for a busy season of processing applications and have built a system that will help us carefully track each and every one to ensure that our process is pure and our paperwork doesn't get lost in shuffle. Our attempts to be fully staffed in the special education department have neither ceased nor lessened in degree. Um, and we've conducted many interviews for the open RSP position at Parkside. I shared at CDAG last night that we were fully staffed for about three and a half hours. Um, and then unfortunately, um, the candidate who we'd offered a position to and who had accepted was coming from out of state and his relocation plans fell through. That's actually happened to us a couple of times with that position. Um, so we are shaking every tree and finding creative solutions to our region's extreme staffing shortages and engaged with the CDAG last night to come up with some ideas for how to find new staff as well as to ensure retention of our current staff by making sure that they feel appreciated and supported. We recently finalized our disproportionality review from the Special Education Compliance Monitoring System Division of CDE. The purpose of the review was to make sure that we were not over-identifying students across different ethnicities and disability categories. This required us to conduct comprehensive reviews of 20 files that CDE selected for us to review, cross-referencing with compliance indicators and all legal requirements and submitting um, detailed annotated packets back for them to review and, um, and come up with their findings. The extensive amount of time that it took to analyze and annotate the student files paid off in CDE's results finding us in full compliance across all areas. 
very exciting news. We spent many days in December putting together a request for information in response to a CDE compliance complaint that was filed. The CDE's response indicates that our programs are starting to fall in line with what CDE considers compliant delivery, and we were very pleased with their findings. The workload demand, as you can hear from the aforementioned items, is quite challenging, and we've been trying to find a solution to address the volume of emails and phone calls and tasks that come across the two departments. At last night's CDAG meeting, I was given some very valuable feedback, and I'm going to engage in some thought partnering with Dr. Kemp, uh, Dr. Kemp regarding how to work through some barriers that are impacting our priorities, um, most specifically um, as they relate to communication. I want to thank uh, Casey Robinson, one of our parent representatives on CDAG, for offering to help with the planning of the parent meetings that are well overdue. And while we aren't yet where we want to be, we're making steady progress, and I look forward to continued growth and partnership.
He is also projecting the cost of living allowance or the COLA to be 3.46%, which is about 0.89% increase from the adopted budget that we had. Um, while it is great because special education AB602 funds will be increased by that COLA, it will not increase the amount of funding our district gets as we are in basic aid status. So we have to keep that in mind. There are no one-time funds expected with this budget, finally. Um, it was kind of surprising to see it in written uh, uh, word from the workshop yesterday, and they show 13, 14, 14, 15, 15, 16, and 16, 17, 17, 18, we had one-time funds. So here we are in 18, uh, excuse me, 1920, we're not expecting to have any funds. Uh, one-time funds. Um, it really sounds like the governor is going to be pressing to have any additional funds put into uh, places like the early child learning. Um, I have given uh, all the board members, and it can be available to the community as well, just need to ask, um, the little brief summary of the uh, budget by School Services of California, and they call it a pocket budget, and it just highlights all the, the um, things that are in the educational budget. And when doing the second interim, I will incorporate this information that we got from the proposed budget, but I have to keep in mind that not all of this that he proposes will come to fruition in the final budget because he is a new governor and his legislature has to review what he has requested and it will be up to them to actually do the final budget. Of course, we'll be looking for the May revise um, and to see if any numbers change in May, we will get the final, what the cost of living uh, um, percentage is and we will incorporate that. Um, there's a new section that will be added to the LCAP, and it's called the LCFF Budget Overview for Parents. And this is to make the LCAP more user-friendly for parents. Um, it's just another section that is going to take us a little bit more time to get completed. Desmond and I will be working, excuse me, starting the process to create the second interim report, which will be presented in March. And that is the second report. Thank you. No correspondence. I have F communications from the board. I have uh, G public comment. So this is an opportunity for the public to speak to the board on matters that are not on the agenda. Can you first have, um, James from comments? Good evening, board president Martinez. Honorable board members. My name is James Rigaldas. I live at 1861 Donner Avenue here in San Bruno. Uh, I've got a 28-year-old son and a 25-year-old daughter. We both went through these school systems here. Um, I'm a public educated kid myself, and I'm glad to be here in front of you to speak to you tonight and your parents that are involved in their school, which is great to see. Uh, folks involved in their schools and in their community. I'm here tonight representing the San Mateo Building and Construction Trade Council. And the Building Trade Council is comprised of 24 construction unions, 16,000 highly skilled men and women here in San Mateo County. Uh, they're working for union contractors and they're working families standing together. Uh, I'm here tonight to talk about project labor agreements and what those mean for our communities. They're also known as community and workforce agreements. They've been used on large infrastructure jobs, dating back to the Hoover Dam. Um, what these agreements do and what I do for the Building Trade Council is negotiate agreements with city councils, developers, school boards, public entities like the airport that set the uh, wage of standards and conditions of the job site. But they also offer that community benefits. Part of the community benefits that they offer back is ensuring that they 
hire local contractors, local workers, local apprentices. Uh, there's clauses in there that hire returning veterans from our military, pre-apprenticeship uh, students from a trade inspectory program held up at Skyline College. These offer more community benefits back to uh, our communities and ensures that local workers are going to be hired for our construction dollars and our taxpayer dollars. Part of the, uh, which goes in conjunction with the working families platforms, all these, all these contractors and developers and city councils and school boards believe in the working families platform, which is earn a wage that you can live on here, uh, here in this highest price county. Health care for you and your family, something to retire on. And through our apprenticeship programs, and through our, our salaries, we fund one of the largest privately funded education systems in these United States through the apprenticeship programs in, in the United States. So it only makes sense that we partner with other education systems to ensure that the future uh, workforce that are building our facilities are trained at what they do so that way they're, they're built right the first time, on time, and on budget. I'll give you two examples of uh, facilities, public facilities that were built. One is a public library in Palo Alto, and another is a public library in Gilroy. The public library in Palo Alto, where there are not even prevailing wage laws because they're a charter city, was built um, without, a, without a project labor agreement. It was uh, millions of dollars in overruns, uh, delayed a couple of different years. Uh, the project in Gilroy was done under a project labor agreement. It was done on time on, on budget. So that's one example. Uh, some of the project labor agreements that we have include the College of San Mateo, the San Mateo Unified High School District, the South San Francisco Unified High School District. Uh, we have a $5 billion relationship under a project labor agreement with the San Francisco Airport. And when you guys finally do decide to pick a developer, a construction manager, and a, a architect firm, I would highly encourage you to have them get a hold of my office, so that way hopefully we can negotiate an agreement to ensure that local workers will be hired to build your facilities. These school facilities are very important. We need to make sure that they stay on the test of time for our students, even though my kids aren't in class anymore. You know, I know that you know, we need to have these schools safe for all of the future, future generations that are gonna come before us. And entering into a community workforce agreement is one of the ways to do that to ensure that we have a skilled and trained workforce through our apprenticeship programs to ensure that we build these facilities to stand the test of time that our constituents would be proud of. So in closing, I'd just like to say hello to my dear friend who was my uh, daughter and son's kindergarten teacher, Fran Dunn, living there. <laughs> I'd be remiss if I didn't say hello to you in the public setting. And just to thank you for allowing me the time to speak tonight, and I hope to look forward to seeing you guys soon. Thank you, James, for coming. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for coming last night. Hey, Brenda. I agree. Um, just wanted to make a quick statement because um, talking about surveys and parent input, um, my name is Andrea. Um, I'm working with the Ed Foundation to work on marketing communications, and one of the first steps that we have to take is a survey because we need to get a pulse on where the community is before you start pushing out communication, before you start implementing 21st century curriculum changes. So it is important, but as a parent, it's equally important to get the feedback from the parents face to face and to communicate with parents regularly. So I think it does take both approaches. So I just wanted to, from a market research background perspective, support the surveys, but as a San Bruno parent, it's very important to communicate. Um, Dr. Dunleavy is our principal and she's regularly communicating with the community. She greets everybody at the front. And it's important to, for parents to have that connection 
So um, I do think both routes are important here. Thank you. So we're presenting to you this evening the uh, district calendars for the next two school years. Uh, there was a calendar committee that met uh, several times to work on these calendars. Uh, they were um, we had four or five meetings, and then uh, it was brought to the Teachers Association for ratification, and we're bringing it to you this evening for, uh, for your consideration. To the chair, so moved. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Yes. Um, as much as I enjoy the BAC, the Budget Advisory Committee, um, I think given the fact that we, had, we did pass the bond and we're talking about property sales, um, I really think that that should be a publicly noticed meeting. And so what, what I recommend is that staff come back with a legal memo um, looking at all of our meetings and saying which meeting should be publicly noticed and which shouldn't. So this is the business advisory committee. This is not the budget advisory committee. Sorry. Okay, so there's a separate committee that is publicly noticed that uh, has not has not met yet this year, but will be meeting. And this is separate. This is a, a committee for uh, board members to meet with the superintendent regarding those various things. So these are superintendent subcommittee, not the. I, I understand okay. that, but I understand that the BAC, correct me if I'm wrong, Kevin, mm -hmm. we met on Wednesday, correct? No, that was the business advisory that met on Sorry, Wednesday. Sorry, business advisory committee. But regardless, we're talking about money, correct? Mm -hmm. The this was, there are different types of committees? Yes. This is a superintendent's advisory committee. I understand, I understand but what, for me, personally, as a trustee, I mean, it's very important we discuss budgetary items. Mm -hmm. It should be publicly noticed. And when we have business advisory committee meetings, they are publicly noticed. Okay, fair enough. Yes. Do you have any more questions? Yes. Um, Andy? Go ahead. Okay. So, I have some concerns on how, on the process that um, you adhere to, Kevin, regarding this. Um, obviously, you didn't follow passport practice. Uh, bless you, Jennifer. 
in regards to first asking the board members, hey, which committee would you like to sit on? Would you like to stay on the same ones, or would you like to switch or change? So you kind of skipped that process, Kevin? No, I didn't. I didn't. Did I did not ask the board members for a comment, which would have been fine, so you could do. Okay, I, I, did you send an email out? Yeah. Okay. So, um, okay. Why well, I apologize, I didn't get it. Um, so, and the other concern I had was we have a couple of new committees in the district. Um, district wellness was brought back. And I thought Stella last year, that was a committee that you didn't want to bring back, so I, I'm glad that, that we are. And also, if we can have two board members on each of these committees, not just one. Um, and I know that we have the new one, the portrait of the graduate. Um, I think if we were to move forward with new committees, I'd like to have to have the board a discussion first of any new um, ideas or thoughts regarding new committees in the district. And the other thing I'd like to also, um, let's see, where is this one? The SAC, I think this is a great opportunity for us to change the name back to the LCAP Advisory Committee. I do believe a lot of our community members don't really know what a SAC is. Um, so I, I think this is a good time for us to go back to the name change, to going back to what it was called previously. And I would like to ask um, Terry to see if I can actually take her spot on the on the LCAP advisory committee. I'd like to still stay on that. And um, Terry, I, I know that I had asked um, Andy regarding if you wanted to sit on the Children's Day book day, but if you you. This is something that you wanted to move forward? Okay, okay. So I'd like to see if I can do the switch with Terry on the um, LCAP advisory committee. Would okay. you be okay with me saying on that one? The, the only issue that I have with that is that the uh, LCAP advisory committee and the DLAC committees both have um, the same kind of um, input to the LCAP, so I guess I'd ask you which of those DLAC I like to, actually just I like to stay on on both as I've been on both for quite some time, um, and yeah, it's just never been an issue before. Why why now, Kevin? I, I've always done these two committees, so and, I, and I and I just asked Terry if it was okay if I can um, stay on the LCAP advisory committee, and she had just said yes. Yeah, so I'm asking you to choose one of those two for because they they both have uh, similar input, so other board members. know I do know that I can attend these live meetings. I just won't be able to be vocal, um, ask questions or express my concerns, but I know that sitting here and convening with the four of you, I can still bring those concerns and questions to your attention. So and, and if I vice versa with you, you you can as well, right? You can you can um, attend the LCAP advisory committee and see if it's open, yes and, and you can come and do the same. Do the switch uh, that I appreciate. I still don't. There's Terry will.
be on the DLAC and I will be, I will still continue. So you ask me to pick. Okay. The Children's Day birthday celebration. I should have been speaking on the For the chair, um, in addition, I've thought about a language arts committee or, say, like a bilingual education committee or a language committee. Any thoughts on that? My fellow colleagues up here. Say that. Actually, with the calls of educational services. Okay. But you're on. <laughs> That's, that's interesting, Andy. Can you elaborate a little bit more on your idea? Well, I think that the idea is just putting people in a room, talking about language ideas, um, pushing pushing agenda topics, pushing initiatives. Um, okay. Um, we have some some support back there. Okay, I like that. Okay. Maybe a subset of. But uh, we can, let's ask Valerie her thoughts on your idea. Okay. I just wanted to note that we talked about kind of parent input. It will stretch your brain. Uh, no, it won't stretch. <laughs> uh, we, last night at DLAC, we did ask parents for input about different models of English learner programs. And that would be an appropriate committee to explore um, those. So I don't know that if we were exploring other bilingual education programs and I can for initiatives regarding that, that it would require you guys to have to be on another committee um, because DLAC does cover that. Just an interest in your personal time as you guys sacrifice so much for the district. So then maybe, I think the majority think maybe then Andy Cannot, we cannot have three board members sit on any of these committees, and um, you know, because it, it constitutes a quorum. With, with, so the, maybe the next month meeting we talk about bilingual education, then we could explore building another committee and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, I want to go back to my original statement about this business advisory committee. Um, I really think that we should ask staff for a legal memo about that. Okay, we can provide you. Is it a legal document? Is it from legal counsel? It's in all school board. Okay. All right, Kevin, we'll, we'll talk about some materials. So, you know, these are superintendent advisory committees. Some of them are working groups within the board and the superintendent and cabinet. Some of them are uh, like the, the LCAP advisory and DLAC, those are publicly noticed and those are you know, standing board, they are Brown Act committees. And as things come about, we have ad hoc committees. And those ad hoc committees might have public invited to it. And you are, as a board member, assigned to this ad hoc committee. One, for example, is the portrait of the graduate and that's that educational visioning work that we're doing. So they don't, they're not, they're, when, the, when the work is done, the committee goes away. And so but these uh, superintendent committees here, these are standing committees that every year people sign up and are assigned to them. And that's an opportunity for the board to get engaged in some thinking and planning and, and conversations around the, the movement of the district and the, and the work that we're doing. And it's also an opportunity for board members to become educated you know, as a new trustee, you're learning about you know what's happening in the district and sort of the process around those things. So it serves kind of two two things. For the 
the chair, once I get information back from Kevin, then I'll review and then we can go from there. Thank you. Okay, so, um, so if I could, just so we can pass this then, um, what I'm seeing then is the superintendent, a change in the superintendent's advisory committee to DLAC committee, including uh, Terry, replacing uh, Jennifer, and I think that's it. Is that correct? Yes. Um, no, you forgot the changing of the name of the superintendent advisory committee to look back to the LCAP advisory committee. Yes. Yes, we are bringing forward to the board this evening um, a recommendation that the Board of uh, Trustees approve the contract with um, HY Architects Incorporated for the Measure X projects. Um, it was added a little bit late in the uh, time frame, but um, we have added the process of the selection for both the architects and the construction project management um, firm. And we went through the process. We, we had it approved at the December 12th uh, board meeting. The board approved that we could go out for an RFP request for proposal, which we did so. The board approved it. Um, then we posted in the newspaper um, and uh, uh, Rich, would you flip that back up and go to the second page on that, please? It's very hard to read, but that's the um, newspaper advertisement that shows, uh, that was put in the Daily Journal, um, requests for proposals from the uh, community at large. Go back to the first page on that so I can see it. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so we put it in the Daily Journal on the 20th. We uh, posted it on our website on December 20th also. And we also sent notices out to individual architect firms um, around that we knew of. And um, so that was done. And we did it for approximately five uh, firms. Then we fielded questions between uh, the, I said January 2nd and 8th because the office was closed during the winter break. And then um, the deadline of the response was to be January 8th by 2 p.m. And at that particular time, only one firm submitted a proposal for the architect and one for the construction management. And on January 9th, the superintendent and I reviewed the proposals. They gave a very nice little proposal and they also follow uh, the OPSC, which is Office of Public um, School Construction, their guide established guidelines for the costs, and uh, they were reasonable, they were in line of those um, guidelines. Uh, we also picked them because of familiarity, familiarity, <laughs> can't say it, being familiar with the, the school district and the, the length of time that they have been in business and um, we reviewed and talked to some of the references that they gave us. And um, we are now bringing to the board a recommendation um, after following the process of doing the RFP uh, for the Board of Trustees to approve the um, HY Architects Incorporated to be our 
architects for the bond uh, measure X bond projects. Move the chair. So moved. For the chair, I also thank you. For the chair, I also support Terry Chavez's uh, comments. Um, for starters, we got this document, this addendum document, this afternoon. Correct? Yes. During, uh, we advertised in one newspaper, not in the Chronicle, not in the San Mateo, San Jose Mercury News. Um, this is challenging. We want to support the bond at a high level. We're proud of the work we did. We walked the streets. But this, we have to be transparent to the public. And I also am the chair of this. I, I, will, I will vote now. Good staff brought this item back and got more bids. Thank you. To the chair. Yes. So um, I appreciate Terry and um, Andy saying what you guys said. I, I'm, I'm I, I'm, I'm pleased, um, and I'll tell you why. Although I was not supportive of moving forward with the bond, it does not keep me from doing my due diligence. As a board member, the voters entrusted me to be accountable for what we do um, on behalf of our children. And if we're gonna continue to speak on transparency, why well, think, especially moving forward with these bond dollars that was entrusted to us as the board, um, transparency needs to start tonight. And um, I do recall that us board members just attended the CSBA conference. And at the conference, for those of us who attend conferences, there's always an exhibit hall, there's always vendors. I saw the roles of the construction management firms that were promoting themselves, selling themselves to the school districts. I saw also the architect firms that were selling themselves, promoting themselves to school districts. I'm wondering, I actually was able to get the list, so if and when we do decide to go back to the rebidding process, I suggest that we contact as many firms as possible so that there is truly a competitive bid process. Um, also, in our own, um, I have a question for you, Wendy. So you said in the, in the information that was provided to us, an update to the board packet tonight. Um, you said December 20th was the only day that we sent that information for the RFPs. Is that right? Just one day, right? Yes. Okay. Well, according to our board bylaws that we obviously don't adhere to, alongside many other ed codes, it says here that in AR 3111, it says that we need to at least list this information out there 
um, at least once a week for two weeks. Um, and also, I do feel that we've spent thousands of dollars on trying to improve our positive Im this, our image to a positive image with contracting with the PR person and also with the quarterly report to the communities, the report to the community um, user that they sent out. So here we are, we're trying to uh, tell the community, hey, you know, we're doing good, um, and all of a sudden, here we are, we're, we're, um, we're just, we just need to be transparent, and that's, that's I think, what we need to, if there's anything that we as a board, the fact that need to be is unified on this message, is transparency, and I'm assuming, since I wasn't one of the foot soldiers in regards to um, pounding the payment, knocking on doors, I'm assuming the, con the, the conversation was, well, every, well, the foot soldiers of the My Measure X campaign, the conversation on people's foot, footsteps were, hey, we're gonna be transparent with the, with the with the process and with the um, people who decided to, to donate to the cause, it just so happened that the so-called only two bidders were two of the, the firms that gave top dollar to this. So this actually doesn't look good. This is not, we, we're not presenting ourselves to the community as we're gonna be uh, just held accountable for our actions. We, this does not look good. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know how else to say it, but this looks like, looks like some backdoor stuff going on right here for me. I'm sorry, but I really take offense to that. I well, follow the procedures that I was supposed to take based on uh, Ed Code and, and all of the guidelines that OPSC has set forth. I had no idea of how much money was donated by any firm whatsoever. That did not I'm, come into play when it was being reviewed. Wendy, I'm not, I'm not saying Yes, you, you are, when you I, said I, that it I'm sounds saying, like it was a back for, door. It's, it's, for the chair, can, can I just jump in here for a minute? For starters, I stand by my original comments. I said thank you for my colleagues' comments on this as well. We all want to move together as a society, as San Bernard. We want to be proud of this moment. We want to look at the bond thing and say, we did the right thing. I'm not here to accuse you of staff of misdoing, mis misdoings. That's not the intent. The intent is to say, staff, please bring this item back. Let's look. We went to rebuild Allen first. Let's talk about rebuilding Allen. Let's get a facilities master plan. Show the board some plan. Show us something before we commit to, to one, a single architect and a single construction company. Thank you. And then I, I just want to say that I'm, I'm, we haven't seen the, I mean, I didn't mean, explain the process up there. We haven't seen what was submitted, and there's no dollar amount. Is, is, is the architect $5 million? Is it $10 million? And I'm just, okay. I'm just it's, baffled that we only have one bid. It's, so. it's not done by a dollar, a okay. full dollar amount. Okay. It's done by the uh, dollar amount per uh, principal, uh -huh. per uh, architect, per that, in that case, it's, it's a per, do, uh, per hour amount. Okay. So there is not a, it's a $10 million uh, proposal. It is a proposal for services, and they reflect and they describe what they're going to be doing for the district, and in what capacity they will be doing it, and what, um, they will be having work for them to do all these things. Okay. I cannot give you a facilities master plan without having an architect in order to create the plan. That is done by an architect and it's brought back then to the board for the board to review. But it's not done by the by me, by staff, it's done by a contracted service, an architect helps us create that facilities master plan. Well, so, and if I could just chime in for a moment here. So the awarding of contracts for projects is a serious matter. Going out for a request for proposal, following the guidelines, which when you did, she, she followed the guidelines that were established in AR 3111. 
by advertising as she was supposed to, uh, as we were required to in the Daily Journal. And, uh, and, and the, um, these proposals, you know, this is a, in, in the scope of school construction, while $79 million is a lot of money, in the scope of school construction, this is a small proposal. Uh, many school districts have multi hundreds of million dollars of bonds. So that being said, we were anticipating more. We had talked with other architecture firms. We were anticipating that they would submit proposals, but they did not. And so, you know, we are now faced with one proposal from an architectural firm that we have an existing relationship with. The benefit of going with this particular firm is that we actually will save money on the projects because they are familiar with our schools. They've done the facilities evaluation already. They know where the issues are at our school sites. And this was done and completed. They've been walking with us and preparing us for the visioning and the work that we need to do ahead. Granted, they made a donation to our bond campaign, as happens in every single school district across the state of California. So, oh, hang on, I'm not finished. Because the thing I want to point out to the board is this, is that they followed the guidelines that are established by the state of California regarding fees. This is a this contract is for them to to develop the plans for our schools and the construction management firm also to lead the construction work and bring in the contractors to do the work for them. So this particular uh, this this particular proposal we expected more. But we didn't get them. We talked to other firms. They didn't submit a proposal. I talked to firms. When I was at CSBA, they did not follow up with submitting a proposal. All of them had access to that. So that being said, I just wanted to point out that we have an existing relationship with them. It has been extremely positive. They've been ex very helpful. And to go out for uh, and reopen this would, would, would send a message to our person, to our firm that submitted it within the timeline. And so I think we would jeopardize the relationship that we have with this existing architecture firm. Um, and so that's, that's, that's what I wanted to say, is that keep that in consideration as you guys are making these decisions. So thank you for your explanation and your response, um, Dr. Kemp. Um, I, I don't think it's a conflict of interest, as you mentioned, that they donated. Um, at first I, I thought about it, but you did explain that many companies d donate to bond measures for schools up and down California. But I, I have a question. I, like I mentioned in my statement, these might be these this, these might be the best companies for, for our school district, but I think we need to do our, our due diligence and have multiple RFPs. And there's I know there's I, I asked a few people in the community and they said that there are construction websites where you're, where it would it would be our benefit to actually post that. So I, I think it would be um, it, it would it be in our best interest to say, for example, we have received five RFPs and the two the, the two companies that we selected are actually still best two companies for our projects. And my other question is, you're proposing this architect firm and this construction manager. Um, is that for the all projects, or is that just for our first project of Allen? I mean, are we doing pieces of the project, or is it the whole $79 million is going to go to these two companies? Well, they're not going to receive $79 million. Mm -hmm. So I'll be very clear about that. That's the cost of the construction. There will be a fee that's paid to the architect. There's a fee that's paid to the construction management firm. And, and their fee is based on rates that are, that are established uh, and through, through uh, and Wendy explained, through o, o, P, OPSC. OPSC. So those are, stand, those are standard rates. We're not gonna negotiate rates with anybody. This is the standard rate that's established. To the chair. Yes. So Wendy, you heard Wendy said that, we, that, that the information was sent out only once. And then this, um, AR 3111, it says there that at least, so this is like the bare minimum, so we didn't even adhere to the bare minimum. It was just once, December 20th. So we didn't even. No, the original posting was done on December the 20th. That was the first time we listed it. Also the 20th? No, she didn't, I asked her how many times she just said once. So it was just once though. So I, I um, so we didn't even do the bare minimum because it said here at least once a week for two weeks. And I'm sorry, but for the Daily Journal? It must that, have been more than once because the, the okay, price, but, I remember. But it wasn't Because I looked at it today. 
it was $1,584 to do that posting. So I, I am, uh, I'm sorry I misspoke. I'm sure that it had to have been more than just once because I do know that it has to be in there for two weeks. Okay, and, and I would only assume, hope that you would know that, but, but just the Daily Journal, why couldn't we expand our search? Um, like I had just mentioned, I uh, requested the list of all the exhibitors that were there. Uh, uh, we just came back from conference. They were there for us to reach out to. Um, I know that in speaking with James today, that there is a, an opportunity for school districts to put those RFPs up there as well. So, so we really didn't, right, so we really didn't, uh, what's the word? Uh, well, um, put the information out there so that we can truly have a competitive bid process. Um, and then the board can pick, and I'm, I'm, I would like to see, so if and when we do decide finally on this and have it go back out to the rebidding process, is that I'd like to see the top three, um, or I, I'd like to see, as they come in, provide this information to them. Because I personally would like to see um, what, what the bidding, um, the amounts are, and um, for both the construction management firm and also for the architect. It just helps. Like I, I thought the, the whole seven million dollars was tied up in these two firms. So I think I, I'm full comfortable voting on something that, that I'm not really that familiar with. So just to ask a clarifying question. So when an RFP is actually setting up a it's like a retainer relationship with a couple of firms. We're not committing to So we're setting up, and they're initially in the retainer to the district, but it doesn't, like, it's not that we're committing dollars to them. We're committing, but we're selecting them as, as I don't know involved, right? But right? I mean, that's the whole point. Is the yeah, but what I'm, what I'm getting at is that we're setting up the firm that we will be working with, not, <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's the firm that we have, but what I'm saying is that that also the, we're not committing any particular project dollars to them at this time. There's no work for them at this point, right? Or the chair, I uh, go ahead. The the request for proposal is for them to be the firm that will be doing the business for the bond projects. So we are we are committing to be paying them to do the services that we need and for the, the bond projects. If, for if, my schools, right? if we choose to believe that they're not doing the job that they're doing, then we would have to go out for another RFP for the next time we sell bonds. This current issue that we're doing is for 25 million. For, for the chair, just to reiterate the point here, we want this to be a polite conversation, but we want it to also be a very realistic board conversation that we would like more detail. I personally recommend that staff go back, do an RFP, put it in more than one newspaper, and then bring it back to us. To, to the chair, um, talking about realistic, um, Andy, I, I'd like to um, share with you the other reason why I like, we need to, not I'd like to, but we need to send it out. I actually wouldn't approve Greystone West. Um, Greystone West, although they have history with the district, they were the construction management Wait, group. excuse me. That, we're not on that item. Oh, okay. We're talking about okay. Um, then one more point, and then I'll be fine, and we can go to the vote, Kevin. Um, Stella just finished saying that she's concerned about jeopardizing the relationship with these firms. I'm sorry, but I'm help, I'm, I need to, I, as a board member, I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm accountable for the people that voted me to sit in the seat. And I'm sorry, but I would be more concerned with jeopardizing my relationship with my community than these firms. I don't think so. That's, okay, well, I, I need to say this because. Okay, that's not but it's Okay, also that's it. Different. Kevin, let's go for the vote, please. Yeah. So.
pull it for what? To, to appease But why? Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? To complete the, the uh, assumption that other RFPs have not been seen. No, no. Well, um, you, it's okay, basically sorry. asking what, basically, to go back and see what we need to do to get the RFPs. If there's only the same one or two, it's done. We, we, excuse me, but we don't need to see anything. We need, just need to get direction to the superintendent, go back to the rebid to, 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 to go through the RFP process again, but make sure that we advertise in all the newspapers possible, reach out to our local union trade um, council, San Mateo County uh, Labor Council, and also perhaps, um, Stella, if you like, I have the list of all the uh, um, folks that were at the uh, exhibit hall. Um, from the CSBA conference, we can reach out to them so that we can truly have a competitive bidding process. And um, I'd like to see people, you know, fight for our, our dollars, for our tax dollars. Okay, can we take so I, don't, so I have to disagree with Henry's idea of tabling this. Um, I feel like we just need to, in the motion, um, to direct um, staff to go back to the, um, the bidding process. So respectfully, point of order for the board. Uh, we need to, we have a motion on the table to amend the, uh, to amend this, to table this item. Uh, do we have a second on that? So we go back to, who seconded the original? Andy, yes. I didn't second it. Originally, to open up the item for discussion. Who seconded? It was, who seconded it to open it up for discussion? So we, oh, to so open for discussion, yes. right, but, yes. but not to table it. Yes. 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 Okay. So, so, so the discussion is finished. Right, so the discussion finishes that this item has been tabled for a future meeting. For no, us to go we back. We agree to table it. They didn't agree to tabling it. So okay. To no, we agree. Okay. okay. I amended the motion and then do you to table And then you amended to table That's just the motion. Well, who, who seconded it? I didn't second it. That's what we're asking. Okay, so there's no that's second to the motion fails. Procedure would be once mm -hmm. it's made second. Then it's what open for a future board to discuss. If the item, if the motion is to change, then that's with the acknowledgement of the original maker and the second one. So I think the effect of tabling this would be to not go right now, to turn it back to staff, which we'll have a later meeting. Yes, but we, we can also direct staff to. Do you have to table it? And there has to be a second. And you made the second on the original to open it, so we're going back to you oh, as the one who seconded to say, do you second the, the amendment to table this yeah, item? Okay. Yes. Sounds good. So a second. Okay. So now this, the item as it stands now, is not made second, so it move forward to another meeting with the direction already given to staff. And, mm -hmm. and also I'd like to include that in Stella's weekly update to the board that she lists um, the newspapers that were contacted um, and any other venues uh, that we utilized in order to send to disseminate this information out to all these firms. Please. The, um, okay, so that takes care of that for item H4. I, I take it that that's the same sentence for the board, correct? Absolutely. And it would be the same. Right, it is, but I'd like to. Um, Provide some information on regards to based on this. Okay. Right. So we have a motion to open it. Yeah, so it's a motion. We need to present a motion and a second to address the items. What's the motion to open it? I second it. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. So, um, when Greystone West was our construction uh, management firm, um, I like to call it the aftermath. There was a lot of problems at Parkside. Um, I reached out to, well, not reached out, but through the years, I would receive complaints about the, the work that happened in the rebuild of, of Parkside, certain parts of Parkside, um, whether it was the plumbing, the light fixtures, the elevator, um, the material that they used for the floor, and um, the loop was actually supposed to be a two-lane loop, and that didn't happen. Um, a lot of things in the blueprint, from what I understand, did not happen. 
and it, just, it, just, it, was, it was just one thing after another with this management group overseeing the projects. So that's another concern that I have in regards to Greystone West. So for us to actually think about having them come back, I think that would be bad for, it's a bad idea, and it'd be bad for us and bad for the process. Um, so, um, and also if, if it wasn't conducive to the folks, to our teachers and our, and our staff that was working at Parkside, because it was one thing after the other. So um, our, our staff needs to focus on teaching our students and uh, making sure that they're teaching them in a um, safe environment in that building, and so that it shouldn't be administration's concerns on th the material that was used for the floor, the elevator not working, or the, the light fixtures, or the plumbing, or whatever other issues. Um, and then I also reached out to the former administration um, that were heavily involved in the process. That was Ms. San Diego and Mr. Dan Little. And um, yeah, it, it, it wasn't, um, wasn't good for business. For the so chair, I, I, I don't know much about Greystone's um, track record. It's not my purview to get into that. Um, but secondarily, that was before Terry and I were on the board, so um, my question is, did we bring in the union trades? Did, they, did we involve them in that process? You know, I, I don't recall if we did a PLA, as the gentleman was James was talking about. about. I, I don't actually don't recall that, that process. Well, I highly I, encourage that's a question actually I should have asked. Oh, was um, so, Ms. Diego was a principal, so this okay, was her so second, one second, hey, I'm sorry Kevin, I, I'm not done. Point, yeah. um, and, and speaking with Ms. Diego, um, this was her second construction project, as she was the principal of Bel Air, and to be honest with you, at that time, we had a gentleman by the name of Bob Devine, who was our um, facilities guy, and Parkside, I'm sorry, Bel Air's construction, the rebuild of Bel Air, um, I don't recall uh, any any uh, concerns coming from from that rebuild. Um, For the chair, but, I, 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 yes. I'm sorry, Jennifer. I don't know where this is going, but yeah. I, I'm, I'm just reiterating that. Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut yeah. you off. Yes, yeah. and I'm just saying that that construction project went off without any issue. Okay, okay. So I recall the board is is not in, that's not our place. We want to make sure the process is done. Wait, wait excuse me. Wait, what do you mean it's not our place? What's not our place? If I don't. And approve them. It's on the agenda. It's asking for board approval. So don't please okay, don't tell so me that it's not our job. Okay. I think staff has politely offered to bring those items back. Right. Yes. Yeah, correct. So. so I like and, and uh, I appreciate that. Okay. So we need a motion to, to amend to table this item. And uh, Trustee Bonga, you made the motion to open it up. So do you motion now to amend? Yes. Table. Yes. 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 This will come back and direction thing and staff on, on. But I would just caution it should be about the process. Yes. Okay. Um, item H5, acceptance of the 2017-18 audit report. Uh, four to five days that we come out, we look at internal controls, test controls, 
document controls in the district office. We go to the attendance sites. We select sample sites, and we test attendance and document controls there. We identify major federal programs, such as child nutrition and special education, and we test those for compliance and internal controls. And we also uh, do a little work on the ASP accounts. We document test control related to those during the first phase of the audit. The second phase of the audit is the year-end work, where we're looking at testing the unit balances, such as cash, capital assets, receivables, cap uh, long-term debt, um, pensions, other post-employment benefits, uh, and then also AP expenditure and credit cards. Now, looking at the OPEB, other post-employment benefits, it's actually something new this year in the sense of how it's accounted for. So you have a change in accounting policy. And what we call that is governmental accounting, uh, governmental accounting standards, state number 75, sorry, I'm tired. <laughs> so I'm gonna push through. And uh, number 75, oh, now you can hear me better. Number 75 is, um, it's a new implementation, and here's the impact of it. In 2018, you're reporting a liability in your government-wide financial statements of $4 million. And your government-wide financial statements, keep in mind, is the consolidation of all your funds, and then we add in the capital assets, the long-term debt, and we have some terminology related to deferred outflows and deferred inflows. Deferred outflows is like an asset, deferred inflows is like a liability. So that $4 million liability at June 30, 2018, doesn't seem like a very large number considering the total assets and liabilities of the district. But when you compare it to 17, it's it's a significant jump. So as of June 30, 2017, the liability was $1.5 million. And the reason why is very simple. The new standard requires that you record the whole unfunded accrued actuarial liability instead of just the difference or accumulated difference between what you were required to pay based on that actuary and what you actually paid. So it could have been premiums or contributions, but what you actually pay compared to what you were determined you should pay. So it's a different accounting process. Another impact on your statement of net position, or your net position more specifically, which is similar to fund balance, keep in mind, but just adjusted for long-term assets and liabilities, pensions. Pensions are a big deal, and the best way to really give you an idea of how pensions have impacted school districts in California is to look back a few years. For example, in 2015, your CalPERS pension plan, plan the net uh, pension liability was 3.2 million. June 30, 2018, it went up to 8.7 million. CalSTRS, June 30, 2015, was 12.3 million. June 30, 2018, that went up to 17.6 million. So you can see you have over almost an $11 million increase in four years in, in your pension liabilities. This is right along with every other district in California that I monitor because you're in the same plan, just have different proportionate shares of that plan. Uh, the, the most significant reason for that change is the decrease in the discount rates. For example, CalPERS went from 7.65 in 2015 to 7.15 in 2018. Sturge was 7.6, went down to 7.1. That's the, the biggest reason, but there's a lot more factors involved. So what's the overall impact? Net position, right? Government-wide. Your fund balances, really the impact is gonna be your annual required contributions. Those are gonna to continue to go up based off of these actuarial studies and these liabilities. But your net position as of June 30, 2018 was a deficit 6.2 million. As of June 30, 2017, it was a deficit 2.2 million. Almost that OPEB liability. But the pension liability, the OPEB liability, there's all kinds of other accounting adjustments made to get to those numbers. Fund balance, most important topic really because, let's face it, that's what we're really most concerned about. AB 1200, we're looking three years out. June 30, 2018 is what I'm focused on. And as of June 30, 2018, the most important thing to me is this, that the district met the minimum reserve requirement of 3%, which I know, 3% is absolutely nothing, but if you don't meet that, you have a lack of knowing concern in the option, which is not good. And so you have met that. Um, you're actually set at 7.9% as of June 30, 2018. And one thing to note as well is June 30, 2018 was the first year that you did not have a deficit change in fund balance out of the last three years. So you look at 17, you look at 16, you had a deficit change in fund balance. Now again, in 2019, the very first adopted budget, which is unaudited in these financial statements, um, shows that you're going to be negative again, and I'm sure the projections for first year weren't so great either. 
Um, so overall, though, the results of the audit, the main result here. So we've had quite a few findings two years ago. We had, we had a number of findings. Last year, we improved. Uh, didn't have as many findings. This year, we still have findings, but we have improved again. So we're showing progress each year. The most important thing to note is this. There were not any material weaknesses in the audit report last year. There were not any modifications or qualifications to the opinion letters that we issued. And there were not any disagreements with management. However, there were significant deficiencies, and there were compliance issues. Uh, I'll go ahead and list those for you really quickly. There's detailed notes and uh, information related to each of these findings in the audit report. So the first one is reconciling items between the ASOPS uh, system, which is the vacation time management system, and workbooks used to track vacation. There were differences there that we found. They weren't material, but there were differences. Uh, Excuse me, I'm sorry. You said you're listing the, the, the compliance. Say again, please. Sure the, you said mention the word compliance. Yeah, compliance is a big part of what we do. Right, I know, but what page is that the list on? Uh, what do you mean? Um, it's everywhere. <laughs> Um, what do you want specifically? Actually, is it possible for you just to provide the board after, you know, maybe tomorrow, um, just list it out? Instead of sending us a page of paper, just list it out. What, what are you looking for exactly? Um, just all the, what, you just, what you're listing, all the, the, the complaints. The findings. Yeah. Okay. Page 84. Yeah, page 84. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I have to apologize. I have oh, to hold okay. this one. Okay. Right. Yeah, yeah, I didn't understand exactly what you were looking for. You're going to get a list of them right now. And what, what you'll see there, this microphone is buggy, sorry. What you'll see there is that you'll have a current year finding section and then a prior year finding section. And in the prior year finding section, we'll give you a status and, a, and it updates you into the current year if there was something that was repeated. Um, now, again, so vacation was an issue, uh, not material, but two years in a row on that one, so we, we built that up as a significant deficiency. Unduplicated pupil count adjustments. So we had a $8,000 unduplicated pupil count adjustment. Not, not material, but again, something that we're required to write up. Classroom teacher salaries, the district was at 56%, the requirement was 60%. This is a big discussion topic right now. Yes, for the chair. Um, I have specific questions about each one of your findings. Is that a problem or should we wait till the end? Wait till the end. All right. It'll be a QA. Sounds good. Um, and I'll, I'll end it after this so you can have plenty of time to ask questions. Um, moving on, this is support from, for some ASB deposits. We selected a small sample for the ASB, and we, and we had um, four out of five in that sample were some support this for the ASB deposit. So we expanded our sample. We didn't have any further issues. So we determined it to be an isolated incident, but still, it's a finding. Uh, instructional materials, this is one that it, it can slip up every now and then, but we're not providing support to show that you met the 10-day requirement. And uh, so in this particular case, instructional materials notice was posted eight days instead of the hearing, instead of 10. So we had a finding on that. Um, but if you look at it, you had five findings. Prior year was eight, and prior to that, it was much more than eight. 14, thank you. Um, so the prog there's good progress here in the sense of the audit itself. And again, no material weaknesses and no qualifications. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and open it up for questions so that you guys can dig in. Thank you, sir. Um, the 60% threshold. So in your experience as an excuse me, external auditor, um, how do boards actually look at that 60% threshold and say, based on an audit report, how do we make good policy so we meet that requirement? As far as a corrective action plan, as you mentioned. Yeah, it, it's an interesting, it, it's a great question because I've actually met with different county superintendents and different county office uh, assistant superintendents of business and I've discussed what they think is a good way to handle this. And, and you know, the formula is not too straightforward on how you come up with that 60% number. And there's a little bit of gray areas in there what you can or cannot include in certain numbers. Um, so it, it's a complex area that is really under scrutiny right now at higher levels because it seems unfair. Um, from an audit perspective, it doesn't have a large impact other than it's finding in the report. Um, and we hadn't had an issue with this particular compliance requirement for our school districts until recent years. So I think this is one of those areas where the, the district has to, the, the board and management 
really has to do its best to try to comply with the current standard, but yet maybe find a way to be a part of a solution for a future change in that standard. So if we, I mean, just to, this is kind of exploratory, but imagine if we lower costs in other areas, say like water. Could we, at some point we get that 60%, I mean, it's just a big pizza, it's a big pizza pie, right? I mean, yeah. you, you, it's, you have less here, you have more here. In, in theory, that is something that could work, um, but it's more complex than that. Of course, yeah. Right. But in theory, it is. All right. Um, my second question is: There's a procurement item, item in there, and we're talking about procurement this evening. So it was what forty-five thousand uh, dollars. I think it was a capital improvement. Yeah, that's a prior year finding. A prior year finding. Yeah. Can you speak a little bit more about that? Does that come up often in districts when you do an audit? Not too often, actually. There. Um, <coughs> It, it's a finding that will come up maybe 10, 15 percent of the time, um, where a district just didn't realize that a contract or project should have went out. The Typically, what ends up happening is they start a project and it get, and it blows up. Got it. Yeah. Or they have multiple projects. This one's actually not great. I've had a district where they've had multiple projects, one project broken out into multiple projects, and then tried to get away with it. That's a different approach, and this district did not do that. So, yeah. When that happens, we expand our samples. And my third question, um, the, res the, the fund, sorry, the restricted, that moved to unrestricted assets is like $500,000. That is, is part of, that one just jumped out at me. Yeah, and again, is that common? Do you see that come up? It's, it, well, I'll answer your first question. It's actually more common than you would think, mm -hmm. um, but it was a prior year issue, not a June, so when I say prior year, June 30, yeah. 17, not an 18, and so it didn't happen again. And also, we actually found subsequent uh, uh, education code and government code that supported moving it into that particular fund. Um, even though the resource code was unrestricted, the fund itself kind of lent itself to being, being restricted. So at the time, we, we decided to be on the safe side as an audit for sure we didn't have a precedence. But you, you know, the district could have fought me on it, and if they would have, I might have relented. Because, well, I, I yeah. appreciate you for coming with that audit fight, because I think that does come up. Yeah, and they, they went ahead and fixed it right away. Yeah, excellent. Um, my final question was, um, the student body uh, accounts came up, I'm, that's interesting, so I guess, I know Wendy's been doing a, little, a good job of auditing the school sites, right, does that come down to school sites, or is that more a, a different account level, correct? Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely school site accounts, it's not going to be in your general ledger, um, that's what you're asking. What, what's the average sum in a student body account? Oh boy, <laughs> here or everywhere? I'm just <laughs> average. I mean, uh, it can be anywhere from ten thousand dollars to two million dollars. Wow. Yeah. All right. I have no further questions. Thanks for your report. We really appreciate it. Thank you. To the chair, I have a question. So, uh, can you share with us what school districts actually are able to meet the minimum sixty percent? Not off the top of my head. Um, all of my other clients have met. I will say that. Okay. Can um, you send us that information? You want to list of my clients that have met? No, no, just what the school districts, what school districts have met. Okay. Yeah, It'd be interesting it. information for us to know. Sure. I can send that to you. Um, I, I, can, I can only send you a list of the clients that I've audited. Okay, obviously, yeah. you send it to the superintendent, right? And that's just Sure, list. absolutely. And um, I also wanted to say something in regards to a question that Andy asked you regarding how we can actually meet the, the number 60%. Um, I just wanted to say, Andy, that you, you referenced the water bill. I, I actually was more thinking about, so if the district continues to hire, um, come up with new job descriptions, hire new people, then there's no way that we're gonna be able to, to meet that. So because we're gonna have to, you know, pay these people top dollar, which in turn, you know, it's gonna be less money that we can even, in future negotiations with our district staff, so. But thank you, I, I look forward to looking and seeing what that list looks like. Absolutely. Any other questions? And I've been saying this year to all my boards that if you want, I offer a free workshop on GASB 34, which is that whole government-wide presentation. So you can understand more about deferred outflows and inflows. Just a heads up on that. Oh, Thank that, you. Would that be a, considered a special board meeting? It would be a separate workshop, so I think you can check it. Go to Brown Act, actually. You can, you can look that up and find out that you can, I think the board can do a separate workshop. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll take it if it's free. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Second. Um, as noted, though, on page 86, it did note that San Bruno still fails to meet that 6372. And in response to your question, Trustee uh, Mason, another way to meet that code is by having class size reduction, correct? Smaller classes. So we do not have that. Um, well, administration and the union disagree on statewide numbers. At a previous board meeting, um, Ms. Richard and I did agree that out of the 28 counties in San Mateo, three do not meet it, um, and we are one of them. Um, I did speak with um, Dr. Kemp at our last meeting about looking at some ways to attract and retain staff because I attended my president's meeting and across the county, um, we score across every salary scale step, either 26, 27th, or 28th place. So, in reading the audit, um, we really do need to start looking at ways um, to attract and retain well-qualified staff. Thank you. Um, so, I think the motion is made second to accept the audit report. All in favor? Aye. 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 So in connection, uh, in conjunction with uh, Measure X um, on passage, the district has to uh, appoint a bond oversight committee and we um, did a process of having applications and um, we have to have on the, the members have to be, there have to be at least seven and one has to be a parent or guardian of a child enrolled in the district. One has to be both a parent and a guardian of a child in the district and active in a parent teacher organization such as PTA or school sites council. One has to be active in business organization representing the business community located in the district. One has to be active as a, as a senior citizen organization. One has to be active um, in a bona fide taxpayers association and at least two community at large. We received, as you can see from the board agenda, we received eight applicants and they, uh, we were able to um, uh, fit into the categories that are required by law and um, we are bringing forward um, if we do, um, if the board does approve the eight that we have brought forward, the quorum will have to be five. And I um, just want to make the board aware of that. And um, any other further questions? Yes, we do that for the board. There are eight members in the quorum of five. Yes, it has to be 60%. Thank you. First of all, I would prefer 
um, or I think the board, we should prefer we have new, maybe perhaps new members. I know that two of these members already sat on the 7-Eleven committee. Um, my concern about um, Wendy Almondot's um, being active in a bona fide taxpayer association, do we know which taxpayer association that is? Yes, the League of Women Voters. That's not a tax association. Yes, it is. According, according to the uh, the law, it is. It is okay because. Um, it's 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 it okay, which I know. I'm sorry, I don't know that off the top of my head. I would have to look back and uh, I can look back at the old board member, uh, sorry, board agenda for last month on December 12th because it was uh, actually included in there. is where it starts and, it, and there's a whole article in there that starts at 15278 and goes through 15282 that outlines the Citizens Oversight Committee. So we're right, making the recommendation for the following citizens who have made application to the district to serve on this committee. They met the requirements as outlined by California Ed Code and uh, we, um, Okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, so I'm looking it up. The, um while, while you're looking at it, I'd just like to say, I'd like to thank the folks for serving on this. If that's lost in all this discussion up here. And, thank you. And, and also, um, I know that certain verbiage tried to be slipped, in, slipped into the, um, the, the, the tech committee members one on this. Um, I truly feel that if we wanted a former elected official on this committee, I would have preferred it to be a former board member and not the former mayor of San Bruno. Um, and also, so as mentioned, we have eight applicants and we have eight appointees. Well, if we would have had one more, I'm not sure if that gentleman would have made the list. So um, then we would have maybe had nine. But, um, and um, also in regards to Stephen Seymour, um, who's here tonight, it says there that he is um, a member of Senior Citizens um, Organization. Um, do you, can you share with us which one that is? Is that the, I do know that you volunteer at the Senior Citizens, but I don't know if that constitutes you representing that population of the community. So uh, can you tell me which organization he listed on it's his actually, application? So he's a member of the public, so I mean, Yeah, so, yeah. so he indicated on his application that, uh, that he qualified under community at large and acted in a senior, senior citizens organization. So regarding that, he checked that, he listed the organization. We don't have the applications here with us, but we're presenting the name forward as this and that it's out of order for the board to interact with the public regarding this, but we can provide the board with uh, with that information if that's what the desire of the board is. Um, I, I'd also like to add that he's not a senior citizen, he's a young man, so. Right, well, and, that, and, that's, and that's my point, actually, um, because, I, so are, so is he, did he list so an application that he's a member of the, of the San Bruno Senior Citizens Advisory Board? He listed that he's active in a senior citizens organization. There are a variety of senior citizen organizations including one, for, for example, AARP would be a bona fide senior citizens organization. And there are a variety of other senior citizen organizations 
that are listed, and, and so those individuals who qualify for that, there are several other members on there that would probably qualify if they had listed their membership, but this was the one that Stephen had to do. Okay, so, um, okay. Um, I'd like to uh, vote on these people um, individually. No. Um, to no. be honest with you, I think that, um, uh, yes, I, I'd like to vote um, we already have the indictment, sorry, for being seconded. I think we'll continue with the vote. Roll call. Roll call vote. Senator Blanco? No. Ms. Chavez? Yes. Dr. Sanchez? Aye. Mr. Mason? Yes. Mr. Martinez? Aye. That passes a four to one. Seven, resolution of the San Bruno Park District approving the form of preliminary official statement prepared in connection with the issuance of San Bruno Park School District, San Mateo, California, general obligation bonds 2018 election, 2019 series A. So as we go out to the uh, to the investors uh, to sell bonds, we uh, have to bring forward to the board of resolution every time we sell one of the series. And so we have uh, Meredith here from EWK, uh, our attorney, to answer any questions regarding this. This is a procedural requirement for us to uh, to uh, put to, to advertise the sale of the bonds. Uh, and thank you, Meredith. Good evening, President Martinez, members of the board, Dr. Kemp. Um, you're being asked tonight to approve one document, and it's actually not a contract or an agreement. It's a marketing document. Um, and if you had a chance to look through it, you'll notice that it contains some information as well as some blanks about the terms of the bonds. It describes the tax base of the district. Um, it also describes some financial information and some basic um, data and dem demographic information about the district. This is the document that investors will receive prior to deciding whether to invest in your bonds, and it's a document they will use to make the decision whether they want to invest in the bonds. That's why it includes all of that kind of information. Um, it has a lot of blanks because it, those blanks will remain until the bonds are actually sold to investors. There's the pages actually that are on the screen right now um, has pricing information, maturity dates, principal amounts, interest rates. None of those can be set until investors actually decide to buy your bonds and that negotiation happens between your underwriter and those investors. So those blanks stay blank when it's handed to the investors initially in the form of a preliminary official statement. After that contract has been entered into where investors have decided to actually purchase your bonds, we'll fill in all of that information and a final official statement will be produced, which will also be distributed to investors. So tonight you're really being asked to uh, approve the uh, production of this document so that it can be given to investors for them to decide whether they want to invest in your bonds. Do the chair so move? Do a second? Second. And so this is the, the motion is for um, to approve this resolution. Resolution.
Any other questions? I'm still reading too much. Oh, sure. Go ahead, Gordon. Get your thoughts together here. So, um, again, I'm asking to have the credit card statements included um, under this item, under the points. Um, uh, so, I'd like to um, hopefully have a discussion with my colleagues on, um, again, the back to transparency. Um, this would be a good uh, way of practicing what we preach and um, to have the credit card statements um, included in the warrants. For the chair, are you asking input for your, from your colleagues, Jennifer? Um, well, I was just giving you some time to ask your questions. We can no, it's, um, I think I'm maybe at a, at a certain threshold or certain items, I'm sure that's that seems reasonable. Uh, let me just go with my questions real quick. Um, again, we've got the twenty-two thousand dollars for water. Um, what does staff discuss as far as water usage and you know drought tolerant planting? And then what are some general high-level uh, explanations of that? Can you get into that again? So you know the water bills is one of those things that um, we have control over by having good plumbing. Uh, by having, uh, like you mentioned, drought tolerant plants mm -hmm. and so on. And as I mentioned at the last board meeting, that the addressing of those and reducing of that impact is that also a factor of what our rate is. Uh, and so, you know, we know that it was is, is the intent for us as a district to reduce expenditures as much as possible. Uh, with the modernization, as I mentioned at the last board meeting, we will have a landscaping plan that goes with that, that will allow us to do things like drought tolerant uh, landscaping around our schools and those kinds of things. At this point, it's really impossible for us to give you a plan regarding this because we have uh, facilities projects that are coming forward and, um, and until then, the investment of money in drought tolerant plants is not advisable if we were going to go, go ahead and tear those up when we go back to modernization of the campuses. Thank you. Thanks for your explanation. The reason why I bring this up is a community member brought it up to me about the in front of the district office is green grass in the middle of summer, whereas the residents are kind of encouraged to water less and have a drive on. So when I ask about water, it's not out of thin air. It's, it's unless it's a ball field, we've got to look at drought tolerant plants. We've got to look at not watering if it's not uh, used for academic purposes. Food for thought. Thank you. Any questions? No, not at the moment. Thank you. Make a motion to approve. Um, where are we on um, including the credit card statements and the warrants? I ask everyone, and it seems to I fall upon deaf ears. Well, I think we need to talk about the process just to really see what. No, it's very simple. The no, process, I we just use the statement. So is there, um, Andrew, you, you, you agreed yes to be transparent and to include it. Did you say that? I, I, I'm going to keep asking I every month. I just, I just, it's tiring after asking staff that, you know, just to include it. There's nothing, um, we can just, you know, black out the account number and, and just include it because it's being listed and, um, I just encourage you as a fellow trustee to meet with Wendy and say, show me the receipts. I'd like to see I, I, I've done that already. I've done that already. But I'm just saying, I'm not asking the justification of the expenditures. I'm just saying to include the credit card statement and um, under the warrants. I don't see that. There's a statement, there's a statement, statement and, 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 and there, uh, there's, there's one. Um, and um, only I think there's four people, um, Beverly and um, uh, John's not here, but there's a couple of folks that have access to his credit card. Um, so, to be transparent. Um, Do you not have to these issues? No, no, okay. Oh, sorry, sorry. You're, just getting, you're just getting on board here. Okay, sorry. So, let me on board you. Um, so, um, so, the reason why I'm saying this, Terry, is so should the community want to see, um, okay, well, there's a, you know, an itemized statement on the credit card and the expenditures, 
we're for, but if the community public wants to research further, then they can go into the district office and ask Wendy um, or Cecile there to be provided with all the receipts and all the, the backup information. But at least this way we're being transparent. This is what the 12,000 and odd was, you know, change was. Here, here you go. Um, now if it falls upon uh, the desire of the community who wants to go and, and research further, then yes, that what was presented already, I appreciate that. Right. But I just feel we can go a little further. Because see, it seems to me that we're just going bare minimum. Um, no, we're doing the same practices. Um, so, so um, that's less. Less. yeah. It's just they just listed. This this has come about because I've been requesting to be. Uh, I think what we're saying is Wendy will be able to do this. I don't get that, but instead of doing this, we, no, I, I appreciate. Like I said, I appreciate that. But instead of doing this, we can just include the the credit card statement in the. Um, the only reason that I don't, I am trying to decline on giving you the name statement is when you look at it as a lay person, you're not going to understand every single item that's on there. You won't know what it's for. We have to physically go in there and put an, I, a, an account number. And because you don't know the minutiae detail of an account number, you're going to look at that and then you're going to say, well, look at all the food. Why are you spending food? When we break it down, which I have done here and told you that it has been board refreshments, it has been board refreshments for certain meetings that we have had, like the DLAC, the uh, SAC or LCAP committee, whatever it might be, those are down there. There's travel, there's expenditures for uh, people going, the principals going to a, a workshop. Um, there is uh, the registration for the annual Caswell conferences in there, and some of the names don't, just like we have a question on Transar, Transar Limousine, you may see a, an item and you'll say, automatically you'll go to, well, that's a strip joint, but that's not what it is. That's, I know I'm being a little facetious on that. So, someone actually said Transar is a strip joint? No. I'm trying to be very polite and very professional in giving you information. And so I wrote down, that's what you got here, the $12,000, and it's broken down for every type of expenditure that was listed on the, the credit card bill. And, 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 I, and I understand that, but it's actually not what I was actually requesting. I have been requesting for okay. some time to have. Okay, but I understand, but it, it, but Kevin, um, the problem I have with my request is that the continuous action to refuse, um, that's the problem I have with this. I feel that the this board requests information. information from staff, and this is, I, honestly, I. This just, okay, transparency. I'm going back to that. At the end of the day, that's what I've been speaking about, it's what I've been preaching about, and we should just have it included in the ones. And just okay, this, this is providing the information more than I think any other district would do for something similar. But it's, it's also, these are managed processes. They're, are accountable within the district for things like this and other things that are way more than this on a daily basis. You're hovering in on one particular thing and, and asking, demanding that the board direct the staff to expend effort on this, and that's. I, I did not. I did not ask for this. I know I do appreciate um, her, her, Wendy's efforts. I have been asking to have the credit card statement included. And the other concern, and the other thing that bothers me here is, it just makes me question. I mean, what's, what's the big issue? It, 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 it sparks up red flags for me. Let's just be transparent, have it included, and if the board, if the community wants to do their, do a level, another level of research, 
then they can go into the district's office and ask the business staff, hey, can you um, provide me with, as I've done already, um, can you provide me with the lack of information? And my contention is this is already giving them that entree. It's already giving them that But this is, their, this is our taxpayer dollars that we're using. Yeah. What do you mean that's their entree? Right. We're using the taxpayer's dollars. What, what's, what's the problem? It's just copying it and put it, including it in our board packet. We need permission. Can we, can we, can we, what do we need permission from? We're the board. For, for the chair, let me just jump in here for a minute. I think what's important is we're, we're oversight, correct? Your staff, you manage operations, that's your business. The, the reason why I ask questions about water is it's big picture. It's, it's, it's ecological thinking. It's path forward. When we have green lawns in San Bruno and the residents, hey, don't, don't water your grass. But the district continues to water grass. It sends the wrong message to the community. It's big picture. I'm not here to insult staff. We're all working on this stuff together. So I'm going to continue to ask questions. I, I'm not going to ask for credit card statements. But I understand where Trustee Blanco is getting at, and I, I echo her comments. But I think the approach is different. That's it's more of a statement. Thank you. To the chair, it's not necessary to create work for the district when you've got all these projects that are work that has to be done. If you want to go down and look at it, go ahead. And then you can report back to the board or whatever community form you'd like. If that's what you want. But we should not expend resources unnecessarily for just $12,000 to uncover one penny that has not gone the right way. It is ludicrous to put that type of effort into that when we have instructional issues with improvement and getting all these other things in line capital improvements. So what is being given is above and beyond other districts and it is completely honest. Transparency is over you. It's just it's showing you the public money and how it's being expended. So I would agree with Kevin and others, that this not need to go any further than what it is now. Well, I disagree with you, Henry. That's fine. That it's, it's a democracy. Not, that it's not, um, actually, it's not ludicrous. I'm not asking for much. It's just making a copy and including it in the board. Can we get back to the item? Yeah. The item is to note that the warrants were issued. Yes. The items that were issued from November 30th, 2018 through December 20th, no, I still feel we need to discuss this further. We, we, need, we need to have it included. Kevin, if you want, if it's you requesting this, I would support it. You know why, Kevin? Because you're my colleague and you're requesting it, I would support it. But you obviously don't agree, and whether you agree or not, whether I agree or not, if it's something that you want to do and requesting the staff, can we get back to the so, item, so be it. Well, we're still, we're, we're still on that. Can, can I just jump in for a second? Thanks. So, if it's if we typically spend twelve thousand dollars a month, and then oh, okay, okay, there, there. But we'll just say we typically spend twelve thousand dollars a month, just as an example. And then the next month, it's seventy five thousand dollars. I think what I'm understanding from everybody's conversation is that I, as a trustee, can go talk to Wendy and ask her to show me. Can you show me why I jumped from twelve thousand dollars to seventy five thousand dollars? And then Wendy can show me why. This is not about you and me. Right, 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 right. I'm right, right, right. just making that it's about the community. But it is, it is. Yeah. The information available if we want to go to the well, district it, office. It is, it is. But, but again, thanks. I'm going to overuse okay, the word transparency. I'm going to overuse the word transparency again. If we, if we were to include the credit card statement in the warrants section of the board packet, will you not ask me one question on it? I will include it. Perfect. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. I, I, um, I support the ones. I'm not following the rules of water.
Um, this is item J1, request for agenda items. And the chair, I have two. So I'm going to ask again, um, my second time asking. Um, so uh, update on the progress on Parkside and uh, about um, having those meetings and uh, regarding the scheduling issue. That's not part of the correct? Request for, I'm asking for upcoming agenda items. But that wouldn't be, that's not an improvement, that's not a board item. If you're talking about a part site, you can get an update. Yeah, I site. said an update on the progress of part that's site. Not the, that's not to be an agenda item, right? Yes, because she, she would need to uh, provide us with, uh, if. But if you're talking about from the, the one school, right? The principal's accountable for it. And, and you I, I understand, and, 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 and if um, you can provide that information to Stella, and Stella can provide it to us in an upcoming meeting, but I would like for it to be on the agenda. So in the superintendent's and, report? Okay. No. Okay, okay that's fine. I'll take, it. I'll take it for the sake of, my, of the evening. But, um, and then also, um, I feel that we need to have an open and honest uh, discussion on the way this district, on the process of how we're selecting the committees. So I'd like to have that conversation with the rest of you. And those are my two items on this item, on the request for agenda items. Mm -hmm. okay. Which is the process, the process that we're, yeah. The committee's just set, correct? Process that we, I'm oh, sorry, I'm here. We just approved it. We just approved it. I think she's the board. Can you the board? I'm just, I'm, 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 that we are following currently on selecting the committee, the committee members. Committee members. Okay. You mean the parents need to be selected? No. The community, the stakeholders, because they're just selected. We actually have it in the next month, I think it is in February, we'll have an update from food services. Great, fantastic. Good chair. Um, another one, sorry, another one. Um, did we, we already discussed the facilities master plan, is that in the works? No, we did not discuss it. Okay. That's post-architectural. When we have an architect, architect on board, we will do the planning for the facilities master plan. That definitely will be brought to the board for their approval. Thank you. And the chair, I'd like to extend the meeting uh, to 10 15. Second. Okay. Okay. Aye. Aye. Okay, um, I think that's it. So, uh, the future items that are noted are update on the progress of feasibility to uh, for multilingual programs next month. And then in March, on, on an update on the nature of NGSS, Next Generation Science Standards, and STEM related projects. Our future board meetings include a January 23rd special board meeting, a governance team retreat at the district office at 6 30 p.m. And on Wednesday, February 13th, a regular board meeting uh, at Allen School at 7 p.m. Um, Stella, for the, the session, Okay, so we'll, at the, likely at the January 23rd, we'll have an update on and, session of scans. And do we chair, so we can still have work on that. Um, I would suggest that we do it on a Wednesday night, on a Saturday, please. I won't be able to make it on, Saturday, on a Saturday. And if we want all the board members there, then I'd appreciate we have a meeting.
the order to attend that? None, so moved. Second? Second. Okay, uh, public comment? No, no. Oh, all in favor? Aye. All in favor? Aye. 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 That passes 5 0. Uh, any public comment? Let's see. Discussion. Um, action item C1, resolution SBP SFSA, resolution 19 0101, authorizing and directing authority to staff to prepare and deliver such periodic file filings as may be required by law. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. 